my dad is at the point where he probably realizes he's going to live a longer life now that Marcus is on another team. But I think we both really miss him. Like we're, it's a sad week. I got to say, we talked yesterday on the phone. And it was like, man, I can't believe it's over. You know, it's like. I can't remember a Celtic trade where I had such mixed feelings. Um, you know, I really like Marcus Smart. Seems like a great guy in the community. Does a lot of charity work. But um, I think we had run the course. And, and this team kind of plateaued. I'm not sure. Watching Denver beat Miami, I don't think this team could ever have beaten my, uh, Denver in the finals. So I guess it was time. I kind of wish it was Brogdon, not Smart. But it's the way it worked out. Well, and that was the interesting component to the night, right, Bill? Because you're sitting here and it's Malcolm Brogdon, essentially the first deal for Kristaps Porzingis. And I'm thinking to myself, this is awesome. I wanted them to trade Brogdon. That was the main guy I was looking to move just because I felt like, all right, it's either him or Smart. And I still believe that Smart is the far superior player because even though he had a down defensive season, and maybe we can go through some of that, but he's still a way better defensive player than Brogdon, who at this point is a traffic cone. He can't cover small guards. He can really... Only thing he can do is like cover up big a little bit. That's why he was like, okay on Harden because Harden isn't exceptionally fast at this particular point in time. So at that point, emotionally, I'm like, this is awesome. I can't wait to see this. Kristaps Porzingis and all you're giving up is Malcolm Brogdon. And then we find out, okay, it gets shut down. And it's kind of weird from a Clippers perspective because Brad last night is saying at his press conference that he expects Malcolm to be ready to play. Now, whether or not that goes over well based on the fact that He was already traded earlier in the day. We'll see how that turns out. So it's kind of weird from a Clippers angle. But then it's like, oh, now it's Marcus Smart. And you're like, well, now we got to think about this one a little bit more, right? Because the first one is obviously you do that deal in the second. But now, even though it makes sense from a roster perspective, it's the connection that he had with the fan base and the team. Yeah. Well, I just did Chris Vernon's show, who's in Memphis. And he said Memphis they didn't know Smart was on the table till that day. Like that 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 wow. deal materialized really fast. Like when the Brogdon deal fell apart, that was when they moved to Plan B, which was a smart thing. I think they just really wanted Porzingis, and so you start there. Like I think I think Brad's liked him since two thousand seventeen eighteen, and you know I think my dad has been to a couple games where Porzingis just killed us. You know, and and that always factors into when you have a guy who's just come in. Yeah, there was one game I think he came into Boston, he killed us. Um, and I think they know the Horford. To me, the Horford thing is more dangerous than the Smart thing because they knew Horford is going to be thirty eight next year, and and just the way they used him last year was not sustainable. Um, I would differ on one thing, and I'm interested in my dad's taking this because he was going to the home games. I thought Brogdon was better in the regular season than Smart last year. I actually thought Smart was the third best guard on the team, and I thought they played the best when it was White and Brogdon with Tatum and Brown and a big. And like the five man unit numbers kind of back it up. Like it, that's the that was the case most of the year. So I don't know. And I wish they did that more. They didn't dial into that lineup enough. It's a good point. There were some really interesting uh, articles and snippets in the Globe today about Joe Mazzulla and how Smart was the voice of the team. And we, we, we noticed it at the games. Sometimes Smart would control the huddle when they took a timeout. <laughs> yeah, my and dad that, would text me. He's like, Smart's kind of <laughs> coaching the team during this timeout. Yeah. I'm like, what? And, and that maybe he did it during Mazzula, the playoffs too. Yeah, and maybe Joe Mazzulla could never really have controlled this team with Marcus Smart still as the voice of the Celtics. The other thing, and you mentioned it to me yesterday, Bill, and I think it was a really good point. I think they want, Tatum and Brown to be more forceful leaders in the locker room and with the team. And maybe that never was going to happen with Marcus there. Maybe they just wouldn't have elevated their leadership skills. I think that's the number one reason they made the trade. And Perkins was on get up. Now Perkins is a wild card at all times, but he's about as connected as anybody who's going to be on ESPN about the Celtics. And he, w- and he thought the trade was a mistake. No surprise. I can't believe the Celtics did this. You can't trade Marcus Smart. Like, whatever. We knew that take was coming. But he said this was about Joe Mazzulla and Marcus Smart. And, and Marcus Smart didn't get along with Joe Mazzulla or Joe, Joe Mazzulla was threatened by I forget how he put it. But that was what I've heard over the last two days. Like, I, I, think, mm. I, I think 
Marcus has been, was on the team for nine years and felt like it was his team, you know, and it was him and Tatum and Brown. It was the big three. And he had an outsized voice in the locker room on the court. I think it was really tough to bench him. Yeah. When did we start talking about, you start talking about it on, on your pod and I started talking about mine in February, that Knicks Sunday night game was really illuminating when they had to bench white with four minutes to go. And we're like, how, how, and God's name, are they playing smart over White in the last four minutes of this game? White has been awesome. What are we doing? And I think they were afraid to bench smart. And I, I, I think it became a real thing where it was like he was being treated like he was Tatum or Brown. And meanwhile, White was a better guard the whole year, unquestionably. So maybe that was a piece of it, Brian. I, I just feel like, uh, you know, it's like, eh, this is awkward. We, maybe we got to just fix this. But you, you just mentioned something else. I thought, I went to so many games. Brogdon was terrific all season. Everybody is just remembering how he was hurt in the playoffs. He yeah, was, it's unfair. He, he, it's unfair. He was sixth man of the year. There are a number of games where he rescued us. Um, and again, he's not a point guard. He, he's a shooting guard. So he shouldn't have been guarding fast point guards. And that's, that's something they're going to have to take care of if he comes back healthy. I mean, this this short a point guard. And, Everybody's wondering if Pritchett can take that role. I have questions about that. I think they're going to have to make a move. Brian, to, just so you know, my dad has switched his take on Pritchard. <laughs> I looked it up yesterday 74 <laughs> times. He's went from like, this guy's a total asset to this guy's a bum. We got to trade him. He's never, where did, where are we right now on Pritchard, dad? No, I, I had a friend that texted me yesterday and said, do you think Pritchard could pay, play 10 minutes a game? And I responded, maybe nine. I mean, <laughs> that's how I'm not sure about him coming in. He was a turnstile on defense. Yeah. Oh, he's horrible. He's horrible on defense. It's not even his fault, right? Because it's like in yeah. the playoffs, Jimmy Butler and I still have no idea why Missoula decided to play Pritchard in game one against Miami. It was in idiotic. In both halves. It yeah. wasn't <laughs> just like, let's try this in the first half. He's like, we're running it back in the second yeah. half. That was an like, abomination. J Jimmy Butler's like, wait, hold on. Are you guys really going to put him out there? He's really going to be on the court? You're telling me I can just target him? It was just unbelievable. I can't believe he did that. But I would say, how about the Washington thing now where they're going to continue to sell off players. Monty Morris, if the Celtics can get a deal for him, they, they're certainly, they have a gluttony of point guards right now. So maybe that's somebody that they could look at. But in terms yeah. of the smart I see, thing. I think they need a wing unless this, unless yeah. my guy Jordan Walsh can actually play next year. I, they were, the Gallo injury was kind of the sneaky piece of the season because it, it they were either, they just had two types of lineups, but anytime Tatum or Brown got into foul trouble, you were just like, oh no. Like, what are we going to do, you know? Yeah, and that's why I look at it, too. They needed to add somebody on the wing line. I think they wanted Omax Prosper at 25, right? And then Dallas jumps into 24. They take them. And if you look at Walsh, it's a very similar profile where he's six, yeah. seven, seven, two wingspan, which is, I mean, the guy's a freak athlete, McDonald's All-American, all that. The only issue is 27.8% from three-point territory. So Brad did say at the press conference last night that he hopes that uh, there's not a lot of pressure on him year one. Like, they're not expecting big things. But unless they do add a wing, it does feel like they're going to need to find some wing minutes. And it is sort of weird that this team where their two best players were wings, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, they had no wings after that, right? We talk about the best wing combination in the league. So I would say they need to add a wing. I agree with you on that, Bill. The question I would have, and look, they saved some money so they can get to that $5 million exception. I just don't know who the wing is that's going to be out there unless it's another trade. Well, remember, they, they had high hopes for Hauser being that backup wing. And yeah. the, first 40, the first 40 games of the year, he was terrific. And then Joe buried him. And, uh, and we never saw him in the playoffs in, in meaningful minutes. So I'm not sure if he can do it. But, I mean, he, he shot very well the first half of the year. And his defense was better than people talked about. Yeah, they, I, teams targeted Hauser all year. And he held his own a lot. It was pretty funny. Every time yeah. anybody saw him, they would get super excited about it. I, listen, they, with the Missoula piece of this, it really feels like they've doubled down on him in a bunch of different ways, right? They, oh, from yeah. the end of the season, they were like, you know what? He did an amazing job. There was that quote from Danny Ainge about you know, he's a better head coach than Ime Adoka, whatever he said. I was like, whoa, what, what, what was that? Um, What's your theory on that, by the way, Bill? Why do you think he said that? 
You think he's upset, like, sort of what Ime did with the Celtics organization? Obviously, he still has friends here. Or do you think it's more like just being like, well, Will Hardy was really the guy that was behind Ime last year, and that's now my coach. You think that was the reason he made that comment? I think that was how I interpreted it, was okay. that his coaching staff was really good during that one year. And are we? Sh- it was almost like, an, are we sure Ime's a good coach? Did you have a sarcastic joke, Dad? A Danny Ainge backhanded compliment. <laughs> right. We saw but, that, yeah. Yeah, he would do that a lot. But the thing with Joe, like, so they... The narrative from the moment the season ended was we're not firing him. He deserves a full year. They they didn't say this publicly, but they did him a massive disservice with the coaching staff he had. Like even not even scrambling during the season and trying to get David Fisdale, anybody who's been you know been head coach before. Um, and then they go and hire Cassell. They hire Charles Lee, and they trade Marcus. And if you're gonna say like. Missoula goes in his exit interview and they were like, Hey, if we could trade two guys, what would be your top two draft picks? I would have said, or, or let two guys go dad. I would have said smart and Grant Williams, right? Like he seemed like he had a really complicated relationship with Grant Williams. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, I think when smart took over the huddle each time and probably said to Joe second hand, second row, Joe, Joe, just get, get back there. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a real aspect to, Smart never really respecting Missoula. Well, weren't you? Didn't you tell me you were at a game when Smart just checked himself in? Yeah, just te- just all of a sudden without any prompt from the coaching staff. And Joe kind of turned around, like, "Wait, what's going on?" And Smart yeah. was just going into the game. Yeah, yeah, that was a real thing that happened. He checked himself into, like, as if he was Kobe Bryant. Hey, I'm going yeah. back into the game. But <laughs> Mark- I think it happened more than once, right? Right. Well, that was the big thing about smart. I mean, we had so many great moments and so many other moments where we'd say no, 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 yes. But uh, he obviously thought he was much better than he really was over the course of the years. And that was never going to change. That's what I said to Verno. He's, his, his best quality is his worst quality. Yeah. He thinks he's one of the best 25 players in the league. He does. He, and that's great. He has the confidence how many times did the ball always find him in the last 30 seconds of a game? Always. It always, fa- and he was never afraid of the moment. He never passed up a shot and he always tried to make a play. Did he ever make that shot? Yeah, a few times. Oh, really? I can't remember any. No, he, oh, come on, dad. He made it late. Remember against the Philadelphia 76ers yeah, was, <laughs> when right. Tatum he, kicked it out to him? He made it late. But circling back to what you said, Bill, about Perk and the fa- and on Verno's show that they didn't know that Marcus Smart was available. I think part of it, too, what Perk was saying is that he did grow six inches in the offseason. So that was part of the calculus there, too. Like, like he, right. He said about yeah. Kaminga, he actually yeah. believed the guy grew six inches. A grown man grew six inches. But <laughs> anyway, right. I can't believe he fell for that. But anyway, I digress. The point that I was trying to make about Smart is just... You now take that club out of the bag, Bill, to your point about the closing the games, because out of those three, I mentioned this the other day, Brogdon, Smart, and White, White was third in fourth quarter minutes out of those guys in terms of minutes And we were going nuts the whole year about it. It was ridiculous. So so I think this accomplishes two things. First of all, you turn the team over in terms of the point guard position. Now Derek White is the point guard. And I get it. He's not really a traditional point guard, but he can certainly play that position and Tatum has improved as a playmaker as well. So Tatum, we saw in the postseason how many times, like the ball's in his hands, he's handling it. So you have Derek White to be that guy. And then the other thing that Brad basically was mentioning last night is, to paraphrase what he's saying, they needed to make the roster make more sense, right? They needed to turn it over a little bit because they had that log jam at guard. And an interesting thing that Brad mentioned last night about Porzingis, he actually brought up the post-ups. Brad, like he was not forced, he wasn't asked about post-ups, he brought it up. And he said, yeah, it brings a new wrinkle, essentially, to paraphrase what he was saying. And we've run through a KOC had the numbers, too, where last year he was in the 89th percentile as a post score. He was phenomenal. Right. And I start to think back to what transpired in the postseason. How many times did we say the offense is stuck in the mud? This even goes back to the previous postseason. You could say the last four postseasons. Yeah. And it, it keeps happening to this team. And now all of a sudden you have this guy that is an elite post player. His catch and shoot numbers on threes, his numbers on threes in general are great as well. I'm awfully excited about this Porzingis thing. And I don't think that this is a crazy take to say. I can imagine a world next season 
where Porzingis is actually the second best Celtic because Jalen is a great player and all that, but he never shows up in the impact mm-hmm. metrics, right? He never plays well when Tatum's off the court. And I get it. He hits big I shots. It's a po- hot take. I like it. It's Well, yeah. he hits big shots in the postseason. But if you look at Porzingis, the Wizards with him on the court this past season, they were absolutely phenomenal. And I just think that it's a different thing that the Celtics, when's the last time they had this type of player, right? It, it's always been the same type of offense. And Joe, they almost doubled down at it, right? They were second in terms of second to last in the NBA in terms of their percentage of shots that came from two points territory. And that's what was so aggravating about the Miami series. Miami's bad defending the two atrocious against yeah. defending the two and the Celtics couldn't and expose had no rim that protection whatsoever. Yeah, they had, they had so, bam and that's it. Yeah, but I, it, it just felt like this is a team that, hey, they had a fastball. And when their fastball was on, like it's a reliever coming out of the bullpen, you can't hit him. But if he doesn't have his fastball, okay, maybe you get to him. And if he doesn't have a curveball, he doesn't have a changeup. I do feel like Porzingis sort of provides that changeup. And the other thing is he's coming off his best season. And he's 27. I'm with you. I, I, I really like the trade, and I, for all yeah. the reasons you said, Dad, I think you're really going to like Porzingis. I don't. I think you probably you know, haven't watched him a ton. Some people have criticized they only played 65 games, but they forget that Washington was tanking, and they held them out of the last six games, so they could have yeah. played 71 games. I'm really looking forward to it, but the reality is they could not bring back that same team. That that team could not get over the hump, and. I, I wasn't looking forward to watching that same three-point offense with no play inside. I thought one of the best three players I saw in person all season was Porzingis. Wow. So, I mean, he was inside, outside. I, I, I think 18 of, uh, 15 of his 18 shots were inside, not three-pointers, something like that. I'm looking forward to it. I think we needed a change. Um, yeah, and the the... We left that game seven that I unfortunately flew back for. One of the things is anybody we were take a the, picture of you at that game? Yes, yeah, it became the sad Bill Simmons beam. Um, we we didn't. We felt like one of the flaws with last year's team was that they actually didn't unleash White enough. I thought White was really good in pick and rolls, and when they would initiate the offense through him, um, there was a little stretch in the third quarter where he just started attacking the basket and you could tell Miami was like, Oh shit, they figured out this is, we're not, we're not good at stopping this. Um, so to me, the smart trade is about giving Missoula more space and room unleashing white officially, because I really do genuinely think there was some white smart stuff last year, not from white side, but I think smart was really threatened by yeah. white's impact on the team, how good he was the discourse about, why isn't White playing in the fourth quarter? Like these were all day-to-day narratives. And when they switched to the bigger lineup, I thought it was not great that, you know, Marcus, I think one, maybe one other person was saying like, finally we're back to the big lineup. And it was yeah. like kind of a shot at White. And it was right. like, White's our third best player. Why are you taking shots at that guy? Well, think about the possible size of our starting lineup. White and Brown at the guards, Porzingis, Williams, and Tatum. In the back line, that's a huge starting well, line. And then, and then think about this. And this is Jackie McMullen ruined this for me in like February. She was like, "Sorry to paraphrase you, Jackie, but she was basically like Brown and Brown and Smart. They're too sloppy. In the yeah. first quarter, like we can't get through the first quarter without they have like three turnovers combined. Like just watch for it. And in the first three minutes of the game, one of them will have like the worst turnover of all time. So I started watching, and I was like, man. Like I, and then you start fixating on the Jalen turnover specifically, but both of those guys are so sloppy with the ball. I, that's another thing I'm I'm kind of looking forward to is maybe not as many dumb turnovers. Well, also they're not going to be able to double team Jalen when Porzingis is out there, so maybe no. they'll have open lanes dribbling. And there's a white Porzingis pick and roll piece of this that I think could be really yeah. fun. And you know they also I think they're going to spend on the mid level. You know, and, and that's where you can get some of those Marcus minutes back in the same kind of like energy, you know, dirt dog. I don't know if Bruce Brown, he's probably too expensive. There, yeah. there Somebody of that in, ilk. Uh, you know, all the second round picks Brad was accumulating last night. There was something on the internet about packaging Grant Williams and the four second round picks he accumulated for something. If they do a sign and trade. When you say the internet, like the dark web, like where yeah, were you? What part of the internet were you at? <laughs> I, I was I, I was exploring. 
Well, um, I do think the Grant sign and trade, which they can't do till July first, might you know the worst case scenario of that is it's a Grant sign and trade. They get back like a waivable contract or a trade exception or however it goes. No um, more trade exceptions. Yeah, my dad hates trade exceptions. It's we call it the Evan Fournier shit special. We use them. We don't yeah, use we, we used it for Evan Fournier, who got yeah. COVID like as the trade was being finalized. But I do the Grant piece is something to watch with this team. Can they turn that into something? Like, what if they trade him to Dallas and get Prosper back? You know, something like that. Um, and then are they going to spend for a mid level guy? And Dallas just got the TPE, not to bring that back up, but they got a TPE. I think it's $17 million. And Grant, oh, we know. No, but they yeah. used that for, didn't they use that for homes? I thought oh, they yeah, used they that used, for homes with they 24. Used that for yeah. Yeah, they but used they used that for But they still have their mid level now, though, because they moved under the, uh, under the tax. So, yeah, I mean, we should talk about Jordan Walsh for a second because. Um, Jordan you know, Walsh, he, who you love and nobody else ever heard of? No, first of all, not true. Um, he fits the Celtics. The Celtics and the Warriors are the two teams that love to do this. Can, can I Horton, just say your favorite player two years ago was Thibault because he can play defense. Still and in on Thibault. Still is in on him. Guy. This is still in on him. Listen, I was actually happy when he got traded from the Sixers because he was one guy that actually defended Tatum really right. well. I, th I totally agree with you. And they um, took him off the court all the time. I'm like, Doc doesn't play this guy. And then they got McDaniels and they weren't, weren't really playing him. And McDaniels can't cover Tatum. So I, I never understood that to begin with. Yeah, that was weird. Here's the thing with Walsh, though. And this goes back to Celtics. This is a Celtics Warriors thing. 14 months ago, he was the number 10 recruit heading into college basketball. Brandon Miller was number nine. Um, the, if you look at the list, like the top five guys, like the guy Dallas ended up taking, I think was one or two, but Walsh was like, he was like a five-star kick-ass recruit. And he goes to this Arkansas team and they have a ton of shooting and, and you know, he's, they, it's not like they're going to run play for him. So he became like the, the kind of the Marcus smart slash whoever of that team. Like he did all the dirty work. He jumped off the TV for me in the tournament. And the only reason I remember this is because I was watching them. They beat the one seed in the second round game. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? I love this guy and did the research. I was like, Jesus, he was the 10th guy. in the." So anyway, he fell to 39 because of the shooting. And, um, you know, but to me, he has a specific skill that this team needs. And maybe he won't play next year, but you get that guy 39, you can groom him in a year from now. I think you're going to like that guy, dad. He's, yeah. he's a maniac. He is like a dives into Wick and his family going for a loose ball kind of guy. Like he's an absolute maniac. So I'm in. Yeah. And the other thing I like about that is they traded down a couple of times so they could basically get up there in terms of what they can spend in terms of the salary cap space, the $5 million. But the other component is I look at the two teams that made it to the Western Conference Finals. Austin Reeves, that was cheap labor last season. Now, obviously, he's going to get really expensive, right? And I'm not saying, yep. obviously, Walsh doesn't profile to be a guy on the ball, but he can provide you, if everything turns out like it was at the collegiate level, elite level athleticism and an elite level defender on the wing line, which is obviously- Elite, like top like, of the line elite. Unbelievable. His, his arms, I mean, they go down to his knees. They're at seven, least seven <laughs> to wingspan. It's ridiculous, right? He's and the, a phenomenal and, athlete. Yeah, the other guy I think of is Christian uh, Brown, of course, for the Nuggets, who, look, that guy's obviously going to get better as his career goes on, but he provided them big-time minutes in the finals. And the thing about those teams is, obviously, the Lakers are really expensive. The Nuggets are getting expensive now as they get their contracts kicking in. And this same thing is going to happen to the Celtics, right? Because this offseason... It already All happened because Grant yeah. was their cheap guy and he was about to become expensive. So I, right. you're totally right. They needed and, cheap guys. Yeah. And think about it, too, because now Jalen gets the 295 and then Tatum's going to get the contract north of $300 million. You need to hit on some of these guys. It's almost like in the NFL, right, where we talk about, yep. hey, if you can get a receiver in the first round and you have it a very little or small cap hit, the Jamar Chases of the world, all that, all those guys that have hit Justin Jefferson, Debo Samuel for the Niners, if you can get one of those guys to hit, even if he's not a star level player, like Brown's not a star. I mean, obviously Reeves is a really good player, but Brown's not a star. But if they can just contribute to winning basketball, and that's why I think you look at the trends. It's like, it's like, like right, Jack Jones, like getting Jack Jones in the fourth round. Some pan, shut down cornerback, assuming he's not going to be in jail. But yeah, I'm with you. 
So I, I, I really, I'm optimistic and I like the profile because you look at the guys they skipped on there, right? I really like the Sensaba kid from Ohio State because he was a bucket getter and I liked Colby Jones as well. But then you looked at the player they got, you could see they were definitely going for a certain type. And Brad even said that, like at the press yeah. conference, he said, we had a couple of guys in mind. So obviously what I so think- So that's they your had, theory is right. They, so they're waiting for Prosper at 25 and Walsh was like choice B. Yeah, so if Prosper wasn't there, I believe they were going to take Walsh, and it fits the type of player that they were looking to add. Like, they had one specific thing it feels like they were looking for in the draft, and they end up with Walsh. And I really like well, the pick. But, but Brian, that this is over and over again. This is the one thing I've been pretty good with the draft, with guessing guys over the years. It's like, I just want to have an elite skill, right? Once you get past, like, 20... I remember Nick Claxton one year. He was, like, my favorite guy late round. I remember... The, where we didn't take him. And I was like, oh man, like that's, I know what that guy is. He's an energy guy with long arms. He's around the rim and that's who he is. Um, this is what Walsh is. Walsh, we know what he is. He's, he's going to be high energy defense. Thibel is another one I loved. I still feel, I'm still buying, the, sell me your Thibel stock. I'm, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still in. I, I'm still, I think just bad situations for him. And same thing for like a shooter, like somebody like Reeves, just knows how to score like it, he's not yeah. like a three-point shooter he's a you know he gets to the foul line and and does different things so i think that was the case for pritchard too that they felt like criticism he was that the, the celtics didn't take uh his teammate in arkansas nick jones who was sitting there at 25 um well clutch had, guy I, I don't think they had celtics mess with clutch because i don't think clutch that, likes the celtics oh yeah he was a clutch guy yeah, he's uh, a clutch guy. Yeah. I heard last night they were saying saying on the draft coverage, which uh, that's a whole different story, but they say saying oh, on the it draft coverage, it was terrible. They were saying that Rich Paul was calling got teams in the second round about one of his guys, like, don't draft them. It was the guy <laughs> who ended up, I think, going 58 to Milwaukee. Wait, can we pivot back to, can we pivot back to Marcus for a second? Yeah. What, so the it's been split in Boston, right? For the most part, half of the yeah. people are like, I can't believe Mostly the younger fans, right? Who like grew up with Marcus, who this was their first traumatic Celtics trade, basically. And then the older fans are like, yeah, it's maybe it was time for him to go. I mean, nine years, and you're right. A lot of the younger fans. Yeah, a lot of the older fans are fine with it because they look at him as a turnover prone player. And he's been here since 2014, right? I mean, so he's been yeah. here forever. We've seen him for a long period of time. I like Marcus as a player, but I can totally understand the aggravation that people have with him when he turns the ball over, when he takes those threes and all that. But the one thing I will say that in the people that are really upset about this trade and really upset that Marcus Smart has moved on, I feel like it's gone over the top. Like they didn't trade Paul Pierce or Larry Bird, right? This is Marcus mm -hmm. Smart. It's, it's not Tatum or Jalen Brown, right? So I felt like the people that were upset about Marcus Smart, I, I didn't realize, Bill, and maybe I, I was, maybe it's just dumb. I didn't realize it. I didn't understand the attachment that everybody had to smart right like i, I haven't you know seen what it was is because whatever we think the celtics mean as a franchise 78 years however long it's been and all the titles and the history and tommy heinz and the tommy points and the legacy of the team he really got that and understood it and embraced it and threw himself into it and hey i just thought he was an awesome celtic and he was great in the community yeah. Um, I loved how he talked about his story as a, as a kid growing up, how tough yeah. his life was and how he wanted to be a role model. And, uh, you know, I, I think he genuinely loved being on the team. I think in his head, he basically said this, like he wanted to spend his whole career here and probably be Brian Scalabrini after he retired and start doing TV and stuff. So um, I think that was all parts of it. We haven't had a lot of guys like... It's this weird thing. Dad, I don't know where he ranks for you with the all-time role players. Like, Parrish was better. Like, Parrish was an all-star. He was a lottery mm -hmm. pick. But on that next level of, like, Smart was, like, better than ML Carr and guys like that. Oh, yeah, um, definitely better. He was baby. better than Posey and guys like that. But he wasn't quite on the Maxwell Parrish level either. He's in this weird, like, maybe, like, Satch Sanders. I don't know. He's in this weird place historically you, you just asked me the key question where did he rank as a role player marcus didn't see himself as a role player right true. <laughs> yeah marcus marcus saw himself as one of the big three and yeah. uh and that's always gonna that was always going to be a problem i think with the new coach 
Well, and and when Derek White is playing better than him, so I, yeah. I guess the 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 way this trade comes back to haunt them, Brian, is if it turns out Smart was just banged up last year. Like he definitely was yeah. had a bunch of injuries. He had the ankle thing. It didn't look like he was in the same conditioning that he had the year before because I think he was just banged up and couldn't stay in shape in the same way. But uh, he just looked a step slow to me last year. And if he d- comes back next year and has the Rocky Four live in a log cabin in Russia summer and is in the best shape of his life. I could see him being awesome on Memphis. And I, I, the question for me, and I think all the Celtic fans is, are you gonna be happy for him? If he's awesome next year, like I'll be happy mm-hmm. for him. I don't care. Yeah. The trades, the trade it happened. I'm, I'm to me, I'm not spiteful on this one. This is like, I hope he's awesome on Memphis. Mm-hmm. I hope he has a great second stage of his career. There's well, been other think- guys we've traded where I'm like, I hope that guy fucking sucks. Fuck that guy. Don't you think, Bill, a lot of it's going to depend on if Porzingis plays the whole year? If Porzingis right. goes down sometime during the year and misses 20 games, we're going to hear a lot about this trade. Well, and I think the one other thing is what if, and look, I'm the president of the Derek White fan club. Bill, you've been to a couple of meetings on Wednesday nights. We meet every Wednesday. <laughs> it's great. I always bring the cheese. Yeah. My one concern is, and I'm not betting on this happening, but what if it's like, oh, the 38% he shot from three, that was one year. He's back down to 35% below league average. What if he can't handle all the playmaking duties? Now, my bet is he... No, I'm saying that. I don't think think that's happening either. To be abundantly clear, I don't think that's happening either. But that would be the one other thing that we would look at and say, oh, trading smart, you made this bet on Derek White. I don't think that's going to happen, but that that would... That would be my I, one other question. I had a friend who works for another team when White was kicking ass in the playoffs. And he was like, God damn it. I thought you guys were going to be dumb enough to trade White this summer. And now you're not going to trade him. They, I think around the league, he's held in really high esteem. Like all the advanced metrics absolutely love him. He's an oh, yeah. awesome guy. He doesn't need the ball that much. He doesn't make mistakes. He's an incredible defender. I mean, ironically, Marcus won Defensive Player of the Year. And I thought White was, I think I voted for him for, for well, he made second team. I might have second, voted yeah. for him first team on all defense because I just couldn't believe like his shot blocking, um, mm. how comfortable he was breaking up two on ones. There was really nobody in the league he couldn't guard. He's, it's weird. He's like crafty. Guys like don't know what to do with him when so they get near good. the rim. And the other thing he's so great at is, and maybe this is hyperbolic, but he's the best guy to me. And I watch every game he plays in. And I watch a lot of the other le- the other players in the league as well. But I've never seen a guy that's better getting around screens. Like, you cannot screen him off somehow, and especially right. off the ball. Like, Jalen will always get caught up on those screens. He finds a way to get around him. Well, so the combo of they trade smart, they open that runway for him. And then the Derek White game and that iconic steal, which isn't as iconic because we lost by 20 in game seven. Yeah. But still, it was an awesome moment. But um, I look... Tatum Brown, White is the third best guy, and Porzingis is your fourth best guy. He averaged 24 points a game last year. Uh, I think he's going to be higher up than that. Well, be, yeah, but whatever ranking you want to go, if White's yeah. the fourth best guy on this team, who has a better fourth guy on their team than White? Like you go around the league, it's like, like Michael Porter Jr.? Like yeah. The league's not built that way. Who is a better fourth player than Jalen Brown on the Supermax, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I can't dribble with his left hand. No, I'm kidding. He'll, he'll be the third best player on well, the what team. If he, what if he does the Pete Maravich dribbling drills this summer? Hey, that's what uh, Wembenyana war- learned from. That, and I heard your pod with Windhorse. Yeah, yeah. Windhorse said how Wembenyama was doing the Pete Maravich dribbling drills, these videos from the 70s. I'm like, can we send like the whole collection to Jalen Brown? <laughs> I, he should go hang out with Sam Cassell for the summer and just have like Sam Cassell work on ball handling drills with them. Like I, I was watching those videos that surfaced last year on the internet when he was working with Harden. He's just like screaming at Harden at one point. This is like the perfect guy for Jalen. Hey, Brian, I, Brian, I, I think you just raised a really good point. It's going to be a much better coaching staff. It's going to yeah. be more diverse. They're going to have. It can't be worse. It, it can't be worse. <laughs> but the guy, you know, they. <laughs> they they put in that big the big guy from Duke to, to uh Oh Emil Jefferson? Play, yeah, to play around with the bigs. Sam Cassell was a terrific defensive player for us. And uh he could dribble. And and I hope you're right. The change in coaching staff 
allows them to work individually with some of these guys. See, this is how I know my dad's getting old because <laughs> when Sam Cassell was on the 08 Celtics and Doc would throw him in every once in a while, you used to go nuts. We were like, why is this guy playing? Well, He's my well, age. No, but I didn't want him to shoot. That's all. I want, <laughs> yeah, I wanted him to be a point guard. Well, well, here's and, another thing with the with the trade and just in general this this next week. Like, are you scared of anybody in the East? Like, it seems like Philly's going to bring Harden back, um, unless Miami can pull off the Dame thing. Yeah. Everybody on that team's a year older, and they have a lot of free agents coming up. Like, Struess is a free agent. Gabe Vincent. What's going to happen with that team? Um, Milwaukee, Middleton opted out. Are they going to sign him back for a ton of money? Lopez might leave. Lopez is going to be one of the big free agents. So I you know. just look at the East and you go yeah. like. Who are we supposed to be like completely afraid of? I I don't have anybody. No, I'm with you on that. The only thing is to your point, Dame, because they lost to the Miami Heat without Damian Lillard, right? And I know that Tyler Hero, like people can argue they were better without him, but they didn't even have that card to play when the Celtics won those three games, right? When they needed offense, yeah. they couldn't even play that card. And obviously Lillard is significantly better player than Hero. But the other thing about Cassell is you bring in Charles Lee, as well yeah. and Co- coach and waiting potentially too well that's that's my point is like okay so if you look at it these guys are obviously motivated to work hard because if the celtics get over the hump they're going to get the credit not joe sam cassell yeah. and charles lee will and they're going to get head coaching opportunities and lee was just a finalist for two jobs but the other portion of this is if joe isn't more pliable to use the tom brady word with what he's doing offensively and if players are getting sort of aggravated with Joe next season, well, then you have two guys on the bench that could take over the team. I know that would be the last thing that the organization would want to do to move uh, on after Joe. But if it presents itself and it has to happen, you have now two really capable guys of doing that. So I think there's a pressure on Joe and obviously there's pressure on the organization in, in general. But these guys, like this is almost to this point, a really, really good offseason for Brad to establish assistance. You bring in a guy like Porzingis, who I really like the trade. Brad, Brad Belichick last night trading down like crazy. And I give him a lot of credit for trading Marcus, right? Like that's he knows that he's going to be criticized locally at some point, even if it's the right move. A lot of people are going to support the decision. But all these other moves that he's made have worked out, too. Like I continue to be um, Andy found Eme, right? I continue to be amazed at brad's work as a gm because i always felt like this kind of feels weird that he's getting the job right like he's just getting the gm job with no experience whatsoever but it turns out like he's the white trade was outstanding the brogdon trade was outstanding the moving kemba's contract and people thought al was just in the deal al was really good for them and i know he's older now but he was really good for them for a number of years like brad's been really good when it comes to this stuff i agree yeah well the thing with joe now that we have some distance, it's pretty. It was pretty rough. I mean, the fact that they've doubled down on him. I was talking to somebody the other day about the first two Miami games, which is when they really lost the series. Those games were an atrocity from a coaching standpoint. Like they were yeah. an atrocity. I never want to watch them again because it'll really like ruin my week. That game one with the the weird lineups and playing Pritchard, he didn't play Grant at all. Right, our first home game, they blow that one. The second game, we're up nine, and we blow the lead the last six minutes because the offense completely dies, and um, they lost the series in those two games. Like it, to beat that Miami team four straight times with how much pride was on that team, that was impossible. And honestly, they should have lost Game Six. That was ridiculous that well, they won that game. And speaking of Game Six, Bill. The zone, which completely stymied them at the end of that game, they thought they were getting good shots. Missoula said that after the game. They actually thought they were getting good shots. They were not getting good shots, right? It was a train wreck. How about the Philly series? If Tatum doesn't heat up at the perfect time, we lose to Philly in six and he gets fired. So that's the thing. The the line of him getting fired versus not getting fired, the Philly series, he gets fired. If they get swept by Miami, he gets fired. It sounds and like you're going back, back to the uh, podcast we did right after Game 7 where we both agreed there was no way they should bring back Joe Mazzola. Yeah, right? but you know, but we both felt really bad because we were like, whoa, what a terrible situation. The guy took over a team in September and had no assistance. And the only assistant he had who was an NBA anything left halfway through the year. And then he's got Marcus and Horford, you know, half coaching the team and Marcus 
putting out himself of, into out games of, and... out, of, out of necessity he, he had yeah. no intuitive sense at the moment well brian you yeah. know this because i was telling you like my dad was texting me in december like i don't know about this joe i don't know what's going on here he was on it <laughs> he, he, uh, were, he was he sits 20 feet away and you can see everything well and, i was yeah. watching every time you and i always like to watch the timeouts and who's in control of the huddle Never, never was he in control of the huddle. Um, and it's pretty discouraging when that's your head coach. Yeah. And I would say, too, like to your point about the Miami series, Bill, I was more aggravated in the <laughs> Philly series because it took him forever to play the Rob card and put him in the starting lineup. And it was so obvious the only way you were going to get big minutes out of him is if you started him because Tucker was on the court. Because what yep. was happening is Rob was coming in and they were putting Niang in. So you had to start Rob to get those minutes. It took him forever to realize that. And the Tatum situation, you finally got to a high pick and roll against Joel Embiid in game seven. That card was there the entire series. It and they awful. never, it, it was and not using, not using white on pick and rolls. And, yeah. you know, did, I just thought they threw white's offensive game away for the most part. Cause they were so, they were either jacking up threes or Hey, the pace of the game, he never seemed to have control over. Everybody wanted mm. to, us to go slow. This is my dad's like biggest pet peeve, was just walking it up. We get over the half-court line at 17 seconds, five more seconds. Now we're down to 10 seconds, and we're, nothing's happened yet. Um, well, been, you know, the, the game seven against Philly, which was a terrific home game, they never walked it up. They ran that ball up every time they were on offense. All the other playoff games, and a lot of it's Marcus because he walks the ball up. There was no pace at all. And, no. uh, that, yeah, that walk the pick. dog thing they did. Oh, yeah. I mean, it um, was cute at the beginning of the season when it was working, but th they were like 25th in the NBA in pace in the fourth quarter. And so you, mm -hmm. you got this lead by playing faster. I, I don't know why they like to dribble the air out of the ball because they always go too late, too, right? They Tatum will start driving the ball with like five seconds. You don't have any options when you do that. Yeah. So that was an aggravating part to me. I, before we let you guys go, I, I got to ask you one question about Jalen, because it appears mm. all indications are he's getting the super max. And I was looking at it. I really think the only like second best player on a team that's gotten one is Rudy Gobert. It, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Bill. I was looking through the list like John Wall got one. Russell Westbrook got one who he's the best player on his team at that point in time. Carl Anthony Towns got one at the time. You know, he's the best player on the team, obviously not anymore. But do you think that this solves the issues with Jalen? Because... The article that Logan had at the Ringer, he had another article with what the New York Times, I believe it was, and he had that been was the weird one, yeah, yeah, he had been aggravated about the Kevin Durant thing, which I understand Jalen's frustration because at that point, early on the Kawhi, the Paul George thing, he was young, so you can kind of understand that, right? But at this point, you're thinking, I played better than Tatum in the finals, and was is Tatum trying to get not that Tatum was trying to get Kevin Durant in there, but he knows that Tatum and Durant are friends, but. Now you're going to move on from me at this point. So I understood it, but I just wonder, does the Supermax sort of solve all the issues that he has with the organization? Like him and Brad, like in the organization in general, they're all good now. Or is that is this going to be a problem going forward? Because it did feel like if Jalen didn't get, get the Supermax, and correct me if you guys feel differently, that they were going to have to trade him. That's how I felt, because he was going to be a flight risk after the season. Well, in the way the league works now, you can get the contract in a year after still push to get traded or, you know, it's, it's certainly not long-term security. I, the thing that I don't understand yet because I haven't read the right article about it is you can like the super max is the highest possible total. You can pay him. It doesn't mean that's what you have to pay him. Right. What is it? Like five for two ninety something like that. Two ninety five, Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it settles at five for two fifty or five for 240. I, to me, I wonder over the next few weeks, are they going to be negotiating over what that number is and it won't be the full number? Because if you're paying him 295 mm. and you're paying Tatum over 300, which you should because he's, who, yeah. he's, he's the guy who has another level to go. Um, now you can't have a roster, basically. Now, that, that is like, you're just screwed. You basically have those two guys two role players and then a bunch of minimum guys. So um, I wonder, are they going to ask him to settle in the 230, 240 range? And what's his response going to be? Because we yeah. saw this happen in 2012, James Harden, a trade I've met or brought up once or twice. 
where he wanted like 64 for four years, right? That was the max. And OKC was like, no, we'll do 52. And they started haggling. And then all of a sudden, the other teams came and they're like, well, we would have paid you five for 80, you know? And all of a sudden, he's getting traded. The other, there's other teams out there that would pay him the 295. And if the Celtics won't, I think that's where this gets messy. Would you but, do it, but Dad? They, but they're not allowed to pay him the 295. I mean, if, if he's, let's say that, uh, you know, he's the guy that is so easily, it seems, feeling disrespected. And that's that's the uh, danger of offering him less than the max. He feels disrespected. Yeah. Uh, he says, no, I'm not going to sign. I'm going to go as a free agent in a year. You get nothing. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty big risk, though, because we've, se this is, we've seen the junior version of that when the guys with the rookie contracts can basically wait a year before they sign the extension if they want to really get frisky. All of them take the extension. It's too much. You know, he, he's playing for 25 next year. So you're basically, you're risking another 25 million. What if you get hurt? Yeah, he's not Tatum, you know, like if he blew out his ACL next year, he's not getting the 295. Has, has anyone accepted less than the maximum? We've never kind of been in this space before, but I guess Bradley Beal would have been the first one that you would have said, oh, maybe he'll take 200. Or Bradley Beal's like, no, no, I'll actually take the 251. Thanks. Really? Yeah, and so throw in a no I trade. I can't think of anyone. I can't think of anyone. I kind of think, and I wish they could do that, Bill, where they could negotiate it with Jalen. I just feel like that's going to be a non-starter for him and his representation with all the scar tissue. It should tissue. be. They yeah, should be like, I, no, good, good yeah. idea, but we'll take the 295. Thanks. Right. I, I think this would be a totally different conversation if Jalen didn't have his issues with the team in the past. Like if this was just, hey, they had never tried to trade Jalen, there had never... There never been any bad blood. I don't think it would be an issue whatsoever. But because there is that scar tissue, I think that there is going to be something. And I just wonder, too, like, does he actually finish out like when he gets the Supermax? Does he actually finish it with the Celtics? Because what we're finding out, it's also very rare that these oh, guys I would actually know on that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I just hope that after they sign him to the Supermax, they have to get a championship in the first two to three years of it. They have to get one. And look, next year, I get technically the Supermax doesn't kick in. But after he signs that extension, they have to win it in the next two years. Bill, do you know that, what's the window when they offer him the Supermax, if that's what happens for him it's to... This, uh, yeah, it's this summer. But once you do it, it, you get... It's basically what happened with like Jordan Poole and Tyler Hero this last year. Like you, Once you're inked the extension, you can't really get traded till July 1st. So you, everybody's stuck with each other for a year. There's no way... But I mean, do does he have a time window in terms of making a decision? Yeah, it's, it, it's before the start of the season. I think it's like October, whatever. But it's a long, it's a long calendar period. Well, we talk about like the you know Jalen the scars on his side, but you know it, like how fired up are the Celtics to pay him fifty plus million dollars a year? I don't. He was, you know, I, I thought he took a step back in the playoffs in a lot of ways. That the thing that alarms me and my dad and I would talk about this a lot is what happened to his defense. This yeah. was. He was such a good two-way player, and I don't feel like he was the same two-way player in the playoffs. Um, there was, like, he, who was the guy that he shut down in the playoffs? He had the Harden moment. It was like a two-game moment where, remember, they made the switch to put him on Harden, where he was right. really there good, go. but, but that's it. I mean, that's pretty much it. And Jalen's like, he can't guard Jimmy Butler? We, like, no. all they talked about was the in the Denver series, how Aaron Gordon and Jeff Green, they kept throwing size on Jimmy Butler, how much the size bothered him. It's like, we had fucking size. Jason Tatum, 6'9". Jalen Brown, 6'8". Like, we had size and athleticism. Why couldn't those guys, like, shut him down? Yeah, and Tatum did do a good job on Jimmy. They didn't even try. It felt like they didn't even try Jalen on Jimmy whatsoever. And the other mm -hmm. thing about him defensively is it's just if, and I know you go a lot to most of the games, Dr. Bill. You watch him play like when he's off the ball. He's always lost. He gets lost all the time and he gets back cut. I was just going to say the same thing. He's distracted all the time. He, I mean, how many times does a guy get the rebound when he's not paying attention? And it, <laughs> he's lost. He's distracted. Or, well, there, there's that great picture of when Jimmy Butler took that three that he missed in 2022. That in the game seven, 
Right. And there's that wide shot of him lining up for the shot. And Jalen's just kind of standing in the middle of the court. He's not guarding anybody. He's just kind of like, yeah. whoa, it looks like he's going to shoot that. He's not <laughs> near anybody. Um, yeah. yeah, he would get lost from time to time. But th- the problem is it's a 30-team league. And he's one of the best 30 guys in the league. Like whether yeah. you want to rank him 21 or 19 or 27, whatever it is, it's so rare to be able to have these two guys. And um, I, I, I just want to make sure that the fan base doesn't overreact to the fact that like he sucked in game seven because yeah. he also played a lot of good games for this team, you know? And, it, and unfortunately, sometimes you can kind of remember the last bad game. My dad's yeah. making a face like, Getting rid of no. Marcus gained nine years for me in my lifespan, and getting rid of Jalen is worth another six months, well, seven I, months. I agree. I thought Brown played better than Tatum in the uh, most of the playoff games, except Game Seven, obviously. Yeah, um, I was worried. I don't know if I'd go that far. Well, uh, having been at all the games, that's what I saw. Um, I saw Tatum disappearing, except for that big Game Seven against Philly. Uh, my dad is really, my dad's really hoping Tatum spent the summer or is going to spend the summer working on what, what two things, that little pull up jumper on the foul line please, and then some sort of post game around 10 feet. Well, that's where I'm hoping Pazingas makes a difference for Tatum because he's, it's going to open up things for Tatum and for two point shots. Um, and maybe he can put away so many three point shots. Yeah, it's it's kind of annoying because he clearly has the capability to do something in between the rim and the three point line. Yeah, and I remember and you can last- see from the way the defense reacts to it when yeah. they give him the ball near the basket, the defense like reacts like they'll send a second guy at him. They don't want him to have the ball within eight feet from well, the basket, and then we would never give it to him. They're not with Porzingis. They're not going to be able to send too many second guys at him. I mean, true. I mean, Brad in his press conference after the uh, draft last night, he's. I thought he was right on target. It it changes the team's style of play. It yep. opens up the middle. It opens up more pick and rolls. And maybe there'd be less reliant on the three, except what worries me is Joe Mazzola, every time he talks about the team and the offense, he's all about the three-point shot. And that was the criticism. Yeah, they, he just... They, it was a very statistics-based offense of, hey, yeah. the more threes we shoot... The better yeah. we're doing. Brian, who do you think, let's say this is the team, who's the crunch time five? It's Porzingis and Tatum and Brown and Derek White. Who's the fifth guy? Like, are they going to like do Horford think, and Porzingis yeah. together? I think he's Horford's going to be 38. Yeah, I think that he's going to lean on Al. I guess depending on, well, see, I think it depends on the matchup too, because if they're comfortable with Rob out there, be a lot more raw. But so you have Tatum, you have Brown, you have Derek White, you have Porzingis. Those are the four givens. I think he'd lean more Al than he will because we saw that in the postseason. It's very rare that we saw Robert Williams closing the game. I guess the good thing about Porzingis is he can play four and five, right? That's why yeah. I would actually start Al. Start I mean, Al. The irony of this is isn't Grant kind of the perfect guy? Like Grant, yeah. the ideal of Grant in our heads to be the fifth guy in that crunch time? Yeah, Grant. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think. They screwed that up royally, I feel like. And I know there's aggravation with him at times this year in terms of he wasn't the same defender. I feel like they screwed that up. Like, how could he get DNPs during the regular season? Maybe it's Hauser, Bill. Now that I think, maybe there's games where Hauser actually closes. Oh, my God. (laughs) Can you imagine? I I do think everybody likes Grant, and everybody says he just talks too much. And I think after a couple years, he's that guy at work that's like, oh, my God, this guy. Um, And... I don't know, maybe he wore out his welcome, but I what he did is what that five some would need. I don't like Rob and Porzingis together, that that's too weird for me. Well, maybe it's an unknown player based on a sign and trade with Grant Williams. Maybe we don't know who it is. Or maybe, well, maybe that's it's a problem. Walsh. <laughs> well, Walsh right away. <laughs> or or maybe it's like somebody on the nets, you know, like uh yeah. or it's somebody Maybe it's Dallas. Maybe it's like Reggie Bullock. I, I have no idea, but it, it feels like there's still a piece missing with this team. Well, you know yeah. who the perfect guy is for this team is Dorian Finney-Smith because they have all those wings in Brooklyn. They obviously yeah. have Bridges signed long-term. I just don't know how the Celtics make a trade for him, but that type of player is like the perfect guy for the Celtics. And I maybe know it's three- Brogdon. 
Yeah, maybe it's Brogdon. Yeah, you're probably right. Maybe because you can still play fairly big that way with Brogdon, Derek White, Tatum Brown, and Porzingis. That's probably it. It's probably Brogdon as long as he's I want to run. I want to run that phone call on the on the podcast of Brad and Wick calling Brogdon like, "Hey, how's the summer going?" Yeah, you know that. Yeah, a little weird. Got a little weird there the day before draft yeah. night, but we love you. We think you're great. Yeah. Hey, uh, Brad, yeah. you tried to trade me, man. Um, it's not going great. Okay. Uh, I think that phone call goes. The Clippers wouldn't do the trade without you. They wanted you so much. Yeah, we, kept we just we held tight. We kept so smart in the trade. They said, "No, we want you." <laughs> that was my- <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> we tried to trade Marcus, yeah. but they wouldn't take yeah. him. They wanted you, mm-hmm. only you. They wanted it's you. Great, they yeah, wanted they you. have no witnesses. My dad always used to love Danny. Who was the guy? Danny Ainge, the like the full shit radio interview guys. Was it Danny Ainge or was it Patino? Who was the guy that used to get a kick out of every time? It was Danny Ainge. Yeah. Talking about, oh, oh no, we love so and so. And he'd be like, oh. oh God, that was the kiss of death. <laughs> yeah. It's gotta be yeah, better than go Belichick. Trade buck. It's gotta be better than Belichick on the radio. Gives you yeah. absolutely nothing. Well, you know, my dad, I know this is Celtics pod, but my dad is very focused on this Pats team. I think the whole Simmons family is twelve and five isn't outrageous to anybody in our family, just so you know. <laughs> I sent well, Candy. Well, Hopkins. Yeah, I sent Candy to DeAndre Hopkins' house. I hope he got it. <laughs> I know. I just wish that would happen. I'm sort of worried yeah. that he's he waiting. Yeah. He's waiting for somebody to get hurt. Well, the, so the problem is Beckham got that stupid Ravens contract, right? He got one for 15 from the Ravens, and everyone's like, whoa, that was so stupid. But now, if you're Hopkins, you're like, yeah, the price is one for 15 because that's what. Beckham we, we, got him better you know, than Beckham. We, we, we have the money. Spend the money on the guy. Yeah. Like- well, I think, Bill, to that point, it's actually good that the Ravens gave him the stupid contract because it took out all these other suitors, these contenders yeah. around the league, right? Mm-hmm. Because DeAndre Hopkins at this point shouldn't want to play for the Patriots, but he wants to get $15 million, right? He wants the opportunity. Yeah. He Because... He's 31. He's not like 34 or 35. So he still can be an elite receiver. He was an elite receiver when he played last year. He led the league in receptions per game once he came back from the suspension. So if I'm him, there's no way I'm taking a minimal deal, so to speak, to use the NBA terminology, to play for a contender. Why? I'm too good to do that at this point. I can do that three years from now or two years from now. So I, I hope they get it done because, man, can they just give Mac a legit weapon and we can find out if this guy's any good? Like, I want to find out if he's good or not. It would be so much fun to to have him on the team. The problem Uh is if Hopkins goes on YouTube and watches, puts in Mac Jones 2022 highlights (laughs) and the clip is 40 seconds. It's like, wait, this is a bad side. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, wait, there's another throw to triple coverage. But who's who's Tennessee's quarterback? They're the the competition. Yeah, Tannehill. I mean. And they're going to stink, too. They're going to stink. So. We'll see. Um, I did a thing on my podcast on Tuesday that the Pats at plus 750 to win the AFC East is absolutely absurd to me. The defense is going to be awesome. Yeah. And to me, this team feels a lot like the 0-1 team. And the, with, the, with the difference being Tom Brady is not on this team. But the, from a defense standpoint, with just a lot of young guys, like a real toughness, and then a couple guys who are just in their prime who are really good, uh, depth all over the place. Like, I just think this team's going to be really good. And it was really nice of you to to pay Jones's bail money because we really need him on the team. They took the wrong bag. It wasn't his fault. <laughs> he, somebody switched bags with him. He took. Yeah, he, that's... Thought, he thought he took the black bag, but he took the off black bag, and it was just yeah. a mistake. Who hasn't done that? It's I, it's quite just, the defense. the The bag didn't have his name in it or anything on it or or anything along those lines either. Hey. Yeah. Look, man, it prove them wrong. It happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Tell you this, I haven't I haven't been to Logan taking the wrong bag with loaded handguns. <laughs> That's just me. I, although I've gone through Logan a lot, and it does seem to be one of the few airports you can basically take just about anything through. It's, it's everyone's just super friendly and they don't seem very focused. Yeah. So who knows? Panda Jack. Our guy. All right. Well, hey, guys, thanks for doing this. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Dr. Bill, I hope we made you feel better about Marcus being traded. Yeah, uh, it was good. It was cathartic to talk it out. Thank you, guys.
Yeah, now he's going to put more focus on Joe Mazzula again, which is where his gonna, focus should have been all I'm on. Gonna, I'm going <laughs> to cancel my therapy appointment for later this afternoon. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, just go get a Bloody Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. 